Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoner Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoner, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. Good morning and welcome. I'm, I'm so glad you have chosen to join us here at Stoneham Memorial for our worship service. Most of our congregation is at the annual Cliff Island Adventure. Um, we've done that in many years in the past and it should be a glorious time for them out on the, the ferry out to the island. Our opening hymn is 373, Seeking the Lost. Just as Christ seeks us, we can seek those who can be redeemed by his love also. 373. And this is a great one for harmony. There's a guy's part and a, and a lady's part, so go for it, okay? <laughs> Seeking us when we are lost and providing us safety and assurance through your salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Sabbath. I'll be reading to you about the world budget. Everyone old enough to have experienced September 11, 2001 will remember that day. 
One of the most tragic events in the history of the United States has happened when two planes flew into Twin Towers in New York City. Our world has not been the same since. As the news spread, the Greater New York Conference and the Northeastern Conference joined forces to provide immediate help. A Manhattan church opened its doors to the fire and police department. Rapid response task force meetings met in the church's boardroom. Various Sab Sabbath school classrooms gave police officers and fire department personnel at a safe place to sleep between shifts. The church location provided quick access to ground zero. Church cooks worked in the fellowship hall to prepare food for the emergency workers. On the Hudson River Park Pierre, community services departments worked to help unload essential supplies needed at the site of the tragedy. To this day, those efforts have impacted the reputation of our church in a positive way. In our uncertain world, we never know when our gifts to the world budget, along with gifts of time and effort, will be needed. God can accomplish great things for his glory when, he's, when his people commit their lives and resources to them. The Bible says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of, the, of them. Matthew 18, 20. Let us work together to impact the world for Christ. Amen. Um, bow your heads for your prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath. Please help all the people from 9-11. And thank you for, for letting us praise you. Amen. Scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 11 through 14. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray. Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we are most grateful to you for the opportunity that we have to come and worship Thank you for the gift of life and for the necessities of life that we enjoy sometimes forgetting to give you the praise and the thanks that is due you. Thank you for the Sabbath, the day of rest, as an expression of our rest that we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you for Christian fellowship. We pray not only for ourselves, but for other congregations that are worshiping you today, here in America and elsewhere. We want to remember those who are mourning the loss of loved ones over the years, but especially on 9-11. 
continue to be their comfort and strengthen these trying times. We are praying also for those who are hurting from fire and floods and hurricanes. Oh God, you are the only one in whom we can take refuge. And so we thank you for your past mercies and we ask for your continued mercies on us as we wait on you. We pray for Elder Christensen as he prepares to share with us his message from you. May the Holy Spirit guide him and may we be prepared to receive your word gladly. We pray also for some of our members who are on their way to Cliff Island. May they be a good witness as they travel to that place today and share with others the good news of the gospel. And as we wait on you, dear God, we do so because of your great love, because of your grace. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. must be on, so that's good. Thank you for acknowledging. There are points in our lives, I think, that we can, you know, strongly remember. Lots of stuff goes off and loses to memory, but there's certain points in our lives where we remember exactly where we were and what we were doing. And uh, I can remember in 1963, it was a Friday evening, and my uh, family and I, we were on a boat in uh, Chittagong Harbor, which is a seaport and at that time was known as East Pakistan. Almost feels like this thing's going to fall off, but I think it's all right. Um, and, yeah, there it goes. Maybe my ears are flapping today. But anyway, we were in the harbor in, in uh, Chittagong. And as was our habit, we went for a walk. We were on a freighter called the Hellenic Destiny. And we would just walk around and up the front of the ship and around the prow and back down the stairs to the main deck and along the deck and all the way back and a little bit up onto the part where the uh, uh, crew of the ship had their quarters and walk around that. And oftentimes in the evening there'd be crew out just sitting and enjoying the, the cool of the evening. And uh, they'd have, out, uh, have their uh, shortwave radios out. And um, one of the crew said to us in broken English, because he was Greek speaking, he says, did you hear what happened? No, so then he tuned in an American uh, radio station, and probably Voice of America, and it was announcing the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So I have this memory frozen in time from that experience. Similarly, uh, we were living in Emmett, Idaho, and uh, we were going about our morning routine when I got a call from a fellow church member saying, Fred, Turn on your television. Now, this woman was one who I would never would have imagined encouraging me to turn on the television. And so I th said, what's going on? She said, just turn it on and you'll find out. And so we flipped on the television and there it was playing out. That one plane had already hit the Twin Towers, one of the towers, 
and then things played out from there. And uh, I'm, we're just sitting in shock and awe, hardly able to think of eating. We had uh, goats that needed to be milked and had to go and take care of that. But I mean, your mind is totally elsewhere. Your mind is just consumed with it. And yet, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a tragedy that impacted our nation. And yet, or I should say, you, you feel a, a personal connection to it. And yet I didn't know anyone personally who died. And so I just, in my mind, think, how much more would the experience be for someone who lost a family member in that tragedy, whether it was from the towers, the Pentagon, or on the, in the airplanes, and those who went down. Um, I heard that uh, there was a ceremony this morning in Boston where reading out the names of the 200 or so people from Massachusetts who lost their lives in those planes that originated here in Boston. So those things stick very much in our minds, and I think it's, it's worthwhile. And so thank you, Bert, for remembering in your prayer this morning those who are reliving, reliving that moment of fear and tragedy and everything else that goes with it. And as you have occasion today, just, you know, a prayer for those that the God of all comfort would comfort the hearts of those who are just reliving the loss. Now, as we sang this morning, this opening song, Seeking the Lost, and the title of my sermon is Seeking the Lost, I could also say that it's, I want to be focusing on the one who is doing the seeking and how looking at, at aspects of the one who is doing the seeking teaches us about seeking the lost. Um, Bert read from Matthew 18, and it is a, another telling of the story of the lost sheep. It's in a slightly different context than in, than in Luke chapter 15, which is where I'm going to be reading today. Um, it's not unusual. There are different times where stories are retold or we see similar expressions. Different times, you know, different audiences, and so Jesus would have been saying something he had said to another group at one point, and the memory, I just fan picking up my, <laughs> picking up the pages to my Bible here, and you know, I'm going to grab something to hold those pages. Hopefully that'll work. And, uh, so it, it's not uncommon for a similar story to occur in slightly different phrases or different context across the four Gospels. But today we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 15, so what I invite you to get out your Bibles. If you have a printed copy, otherwise open up your phones. If only I didn't wear glasses. I think this would stick on better. might stick on better if I didn't have glasses. I think that's what's part of what's bumping it. All right, Luke chapter 15. Whether it's phone, tablet, or printed copy, please get it out and turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going to be reading through it, all the verses. How are we doing for time? 11.45, all right. We'll move a pace here. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now think of that for a second. Tax collectors and sinners. This is how they were designated. And interesting that tax collectors were in their own category of sinner. Why? Well, because they worked for Rome. They were viewed as traitors, unpatriotic, and so on. Uh, you know, a lot of nasty things connected with it. Um, some versions of your Bibles will say publican because it's, that refers to someone who collected taxes in the public space, sitting out in public, 
people going by. They'd have to come in and pay their taxes. Interestingly, the word publican has evolved over time to have a slightly different meaning. A publican, this is Old English, a publican is someone who works in a public house, which these days has been shortened to the word pub. And so a publican is the one who draws beer. <laughs> Nothing to do with tax collecting. So, another use of the term publican for a tax collector. And sinners, and the word sinner that's used there in the Greek has a p very pejorative context to it. It's someone who is despised. You know, real low life, all right? Publican sinners. And notice that they are drawing near to Jesus because they want to hear what he has to say. Um, keep your thumb in Luke 15. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. It's the story of uh, Matthew, Levi Matthew, becoming a follower of Jesus. And who does he invite to his feast? It's all his friends. And who does he invite? Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors <laughs> and others who sat down with them. Tax collectors were despised enough that their friendship base was other tax collectors. <laughs> other tax collectors. Um, and so not only is Jesus hanging out with these despised tax collectors, He's got a disciple who's one. And this just frosted the scribes, that is the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the rest of them. They just could not handle it. For them, someone who was a despised sinner was to be avoided at all costs lest you become contaminated with them. And if you happen to hang out with them, they would infer, then you must be like them. After all, what's the expression we have? Birds of a feather flock together, as eh? All right, so if he's hanging out with, pub with publicans, tax collectors, and <coughs> sinners, he must be like them. We, on the other hand, say the scribes and Pharisees, we keep ourselves pure, we live right, we are righteous and so on. So, in fact, verse 2, the scribes, the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners, and horror of horrors, eats with them, has fellowship with them, sits down with them. This is just, you know, beyond acceptable. Now, interestingly, the phrase murmured there, which we have at least in my Bible, is past tense. The Greek suggests murmuring or complaining. In other words, these guys are walking around in the crowd, mumble, 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 mumble. They're venting their feelings to the other, to people around. Now, back then, they didn't have Facebook or uh, Twitter or other forms of social media, and so this is how they spread their negative feelings was by going around and yip, 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 yip. And then they hoped, they hoped that other people would pick it up and say, did you hear that? Oh, think about that. Oh, Jesus is doing this and then hope thereby to amplify their negative message. They were hoping the people would repost and retweet, as it were. You know, got to think about what we repost and retweet. Is it honest? Is it true? Is it lovely? Is it helpful? All right. So Jesus now has an issue to deal with. There's all this negative stuff that's being mumbled around. And so he decides he's going to talk about this matter with the people and get them thinking along a different line. So he spoke this parable to them. And we're going to get started in that in just a second here. But there are three stories in Luke chapter 15. They're all about something lost. 
The first one is the lost sheep. The next is the lost coin. And the third is the lost son. We often refer to it as the prodigal son. And I have to admit, you know, when you're, when you're growing up, you hear adults using these words and you guess at what they meant. So I thought prodigal meant wandering. Anybody know what prodigal really means? Lavish? Mm, close. Close. Wasteful. Wasteful. Someone who... Um, is spending money, overspending, and so on, is spending in a prodigal fashion. So it's very close to lavish there. All right. Lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. Excuse me if my voice is a little rough today. I've been fighting laryngitis for a number of days here. All right. Um, verse 4. What man of you and I just want to focus on that for a second here. The next one begins, says, or what if a woman? <laughs> so he's telling a story, one that would appeal to men, and the second one is something that would appeal to women. Not that man, men can't understand the second story or w women can't understand the first one. It's just he's telling stories that relate to experiences that are familiar. And so in the first one, he says, what man of you, if he had a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? So first of all, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And this shepherd is a good shepherd here. There are, he loses one, and you might say, 99? What's he so worried about? <laughs> if you got 99% on a test, wouldn't you say that was pretty good? I liked getting 99 on a test. 100's even better, 100%, but 99's still pretty good. That's still a plus. I wonder if I took my glasses off of that help. I wouldn't see you so well. I just got new glasses a little while ago, so I'm seeing a lot better than I did before. Lost one. One out of a hundred. What's the big deal? We sometimes think about the 99 sheep who are left in the field. Well, maybe he's, because later he says the ones 99 who need no repentance. And we think of that, well, that's the Pharisees who figured they had no need of repentance. But there's another thought here. And that is that when the world was created and then Adam and Eve sinned and fell, were here on earth, were sticking out like a sore thumb. The other worlds that have been created did not fall. And our Savior didn't say, ah, one out of a hundred, oh well, let him be. Let him go down the tubes. Because I got 99, they're in good shape here. No, he, all heaven became invested in our salvation and in rescuing this one lonely planet that is seriously messed up. So one out of 99, and yet he goes after it to seek it and find it until it is found. And that until is important. It just doesn't say, if he could find it, oh, we're going to give it the old college try. You know, put in some effort, and then after a while say, eh, we did our best, walk away. No, until it's found. That's persistence. And think about that for a second. God's love for the lost is so great that he persists and keeps up and never quits, never stops. That's just amazing. That's just awesome in my mind. 
never quit. Sometimes in sports, you know, they talk about, you know, keep on going, never quitting, never say die, always keep up. And yet, the, the uh, investment that sports athletes invest in their sport is nothing compared to the investment that God makes in seeking us and never quitting, never backing away, never giving up. Uh, this is just thrilling. Verse 5, And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. I'll just think about that for a second. Here is the, sh the sheep that has wandered away of its own accord, wandered away, but sheep have some awareness, and this poor sheep knows that it's lost. It just doesn't know how to get back. Maybe it's stuck in a briar. Maybe it was eating and its wool got uh, tangled up in a bush. Whatever, it's stuck and can't get back. It is depending upon the good shepherd seeking it out, finding it, and restoring it. We may have wandered away from God. We may not know how to get back but we can be assured that he knows how to find us. He will keep up till he's found us, and he will bring us back. That's just awesome to think about. The other thing I want to note from this verse is what does he do with the sheep? Puts it on his shoulders. Have you seen a picture? Got to pick it up, sling it over your neck. The sheep is heavy. If it's a lamb, he'll carry it, right? If it's a little lamb, oh, he'll carry it. This is a big sheep. He's got to carry it on his shoulders. Now, he could have said, dumb sheep, why did you go off and do that? Scold that sheep. You ever tried scolding a dog after the fact? I mean, well after the fact dog's got no clue what you're talking about. All he knows is you're upset. <laughs> have to do it right at the time, right? Got to catch him and train him there. This poor sheep would have no clue. Scolding does no good. But instead of scolding it, the good shepherd is rejoicing, speaking words of comfort. Oh, you poor little thing. Well, big thing, since he's got to carry it on his shoulders. There is a, uh, a contemporary Christian singing group by the name of For King and Country, and they have a song entitled simply Shoulders. If you can handle the music, I would encourage you to look it up on YouTube. If you can't handle the music, there's another version of it by an a cappella singer by the name of David Wesley. And uh, look it up on YouTube. It's a good song. He carries it on his shoulders. Now this is heavy. Something that is heavy that we're carrying, what are words that we use to describe it? Burden. burden, yes. Jesus carries our burdens on his shoulders. Okay? In Isaiah, it says, he bears our infirmities. He bears our weaknesses. So the shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulders is symbolic of what Jesus takes upon himself for our rescue. That's pretty awesome to think about. All right, so he puts the sheep on his shoulders. He is rejoicing. He is thrilled. He is excited. I get excited when I find something, even if it's just keys. Ha, yes, found it. But the bigger the thing, the more rejoicing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 6. And when he comes home. Now, where did this sheep start? At the beginning of the story, where are the sheep? Fold. Wilderness, yes. Or on the mountain, some versions will say on the mountains, some just say out in the fields. 
And because he's counting them right and realizes he's one missing, that means they've been brought into the fold. So the 99 were in the fold, out in the fields, but this one that was lost he brings home. And when Jesus rescues us, he brings us ultimately to his home or our home that he has made for us in heaven. So he comes home and he calls together his friends and his neighbors. Now, literally, you know, it would be the case of, hey guys, hey guys, guess what? You know, come on in, let's have a party, let's have a celebration. I lost a sheep and I found it, yay. It's, uh, you know, has monetary value. So as a human, we can understand the celebration there. But when, when Jesus is trying to get people to draw the parallel, who would be his friends and neighbors in heaven? Speak up. Angels. Angels, thank you. It's okay to speak up. I've been a teacher. So I like it when, when people speak up. So the angels, he gathers them together. And this is just not a metaphor. This is for real, guys. They gather together, you know, and around here we'd say, you know, slapping each other on the back, high fives, fist bumps. I don't know what they do in heaven, but, you know, think of it as the equivalent. Think of the angels up there giving each other high fives. Yes, we were so engaged in what the shepherd was doing here, and he's found the sheep, and he's brought it back home, and we are so excited, we are thrilled. That's what they think in heaven. Think about it. They are so excited to see redeemed people getting ready to go to heaven. They are just thrilled and exciting. Thrilled and excited about it. He says, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And then he draws so that the people will get it who are listening to him. Verse 7, Jesus says, I say to you that likewise, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 90 and 9 just persons who need no repentance. And I think it's interesting to note that a special role is given to the redeemed in heaven is we get to be ambassadors for Christ to share with those on the unfallen worlds what he has done for us. It is a special role. It is a prominent role. It, it is a, a holy and sacred joy to be able to talk about what Jesus has done for you and I for our salvation. It's exciting stuff to talk about because it's not about us. It's about what he has done. It's about who he is exciting stuff. All right. Parable of the lost sheep. Let's move on now to the lost coin. Luke 15, verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, or drachma is the Greek word there, and uh, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it. All right. We've already talked about this being uh, a little bit, if there's a first one was a story that men would really resonate with, this is now a story that women would really resonate with. It was very common for women to wear, as part of their headgear, coins along the front. In 1962, um, my family, we were returning from mission service in India, we stopped off in Jordan on the way, and uh, one of the places we visited was Jericho, and just outside Jericho was a well. And as we were driving past, there were women drawing water from the well. And some of them had, as part of their headgear, had these coins. 
I thought, wow. Now, I was eight coming on nine at the time. I thought, wow, this is just like the story in the Bible. They're wearing coins. When um, a fellow wanted to marry a girl, he would approach the father, and the father would want some evidence that the fellow can financially support his daughter, who he, this fellow wants to marry. And so he would require of the young man a dowry. They were supposed to give that dowry to the girl upon her wedding. Some of them didn't. Some of them lined their pockets a little bit with it, too. And it was often then that they would, the woman would wear some of her dowry as these coins on her headgear. In Christ's object lessons, it indicates that for this woman to have ten indicated that she was poor. And so for her to have lost one, one out of ten, is a big deal for her. Some years ago, I was reading a, an article trying to explain how much money Bill Gates earned as a head of Microsoft. He's since retired. Um, but it was just such a you know, mind-boggling amount of money. You know, and they broke it down per hour, per minute, per second. It was like it wasn't even worth it for Bill Gates if he saw a dollar bill on the sidewalk to reach down and pick it up, as if him having done so would interfere with the rest of his money-earning capability. But that was, that was just part of the story. And, but for this woman to have lost one coin is a big deal. Now, the poor lived in houses that were often without windows, that were often dark inside, and because it's dark and hard to see the dust, Dust and stuff, what do we call them, uh, dust bunnies? Dust bunnies would collect in the house. And so this coin could be lost in the dust or in the dust bunnies. You know, the hair and other things that we lose. Fibers fall off our clothes, hair off our head collects in places. And so what does she do to find it? I'm asking you the question. What does she do to find it? <laughs> lights a lamp and sweeps. Two things. Two things. Lights a lamp or a candle, some versions have it, and she sweeps. What do, the, what do candles and lamps represent? What are they a metaphor, a symbol for in the Bible? Light, in turn, Truth, thank you. All right? So we need the light of truth to sweep away the stuff that's been collecting in our lives. Habits, thoughts, things that need cleaning up. It's the light of truth that when we let it shine in our hearts helps us realize we need to get cleaned up and then we go to Jesus and ask him, to clean up our thoughts. All these things we can't do of ourselves. We need God's help to give us renewed minds, cleaned up lives. And thankfully, he promises he will do that. So she's lit the lamp, sweep the house, and sought... What's the ad, adjic, uh, adverb? Diligently, any other versions? If you're looking at me, it means you're not looking at your Bible. <laughs> I want to hear things from different versions. Carefully. Yeah, yeah. Carefully, diligently, thoughtfully, persistently, intentionally. These are all synonyms that work. So she keeps, once again, she keeps seeking until she finds. She doesn't give 
up. Interesting how many of Jesus' parables have to do, or have a theme in it, of keep going, don't give up. Keep at it. In matters of, of salvation, keep at it. Don't give up. Don't quit. All right, so she keeps searching until she finds it, and she is thrilled when she finds it. She, and very similar to the previous story, she calls her friends and neighbors together, says, says, rejoice with me, I have found the coin which I lost. Once again, the parallel, likewise I say to you, this is verse 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels. Slight change of phrase here, but certainly the same thought. In the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Heaven is thrilled when someone comes to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then starting with verse 11 comes the third story, the lost son. And as we read through it, I want you to think for a minute, who is the son who is lost? In the first couple of verses, it's fairly clear who is the son who's lost. But then he returns. The dad says, for all I knew, he was dead, but he's now been found alive. But there's another son in the picture, and it's worth considering what his situation was. All right, verse 11. A certain man had two sons, one sheep out of a hundred, one coin out of ten, one son out of two. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. He wants to get an early inheritance, not willing to wait. Wants it now. What do we call that when you're not willing to wait? <laughs> Impatient? <laughs> yeah. Greedy? Poss yeah, that would be in there too. I get the picture of the son. He's just itching. He is itching to get out of there. He is itching to get out of the house. Thinking not that whatever restrictions his dad may have had on his life were for his own good, he just, ah, he, he can't get out of there soon enough. And of course, he knows it's going to take money. So he says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. Don't want to wait. I want it now. Now we're going to come back to that action of splitting the inheritance later on in the story when we're talking about the other son. But just for now, so the dad goes ahead and they figure out a way to value the estate and younger son gets half. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. He was going to get away from dad as far as he could. Jonah was trying to get away from God and go to a far country, get away as far as he could. He thought that would take care of things. Jonah did. Same with the son. Far away, and it'll all be good. I'll be my own man. Get to make my own decisions. Yeah, be real. That's what he was thinking. So he goes to that far country, and what's, what does he do with his money? Wastes it on riotous living, on wild living. Right? Just, in just a few words, here's the picture. He's loaded. He's got money to burn. And rich playboys are soon detected by hangers-on and groupies. All right? Friends who will be your friends as long as you've got money to spend on them. And he's allured 
by beautiful cars and fast women. He thinks this is the life. This is living, I tell you. All the beer ads project this. All right? This kind of living is where it's, where it's really living. And so that's how he's living and spending, spending, spending dad's money, spending, spending, spending. Well, now his, he figures, do with it what he wants. And then something odd happens. Just at the time his money is running out, a famine comes to the land. Hard times. Drought. And when it's an agricultural economy, this is a big deal. So hard times come, and he's running out of money, and he contacts his friend, says, Hey, man, can I crash on your couch tonight? Oh, bro, I got some friends coming over tonight. Sorry, man, can't help you out. Try somebody else. Hey, man, can you spare me a few? Can you spot me a few? I'm looking for a job. I'll be able to pay you back. Can, can you help me out? Oh, man, I don't think so. I'm pretty hard up myself. You know, I'm little, things are tight right now as he fingers the bling on his fingers or around his neck. And, uh, but no, can't help. The friends he thought he had while he had money have now vanished. They can't get away fast enough. They, <laughs> they can't pretend they don't know him fast enough to... And so he's stuck. What's he going to do? He spent it all. He's in a real bad place, and now there's a famine in the land. Food is short means jobs are hard, going to be hard to find, too. Can I work for you? Man, my crops have died. I'm not hiring anybody right now. So he looks and looks. Now, I've got to admire he's still looking for work. <laughs> got to appreciate that one little point. And he finds a fellow who lives in that land who's got pigs that need tending. Well, yeah, all right. I could, I could hire you to look after my pigs. So he sent out to care for the pigs. Now, for a Jew, this was the worst. I think a Muslim would feel the same way, too, because they don't eat pork. Um, to have to be involved in caring from pigs is about as low on the economic ladder as you could get. And because it's a famine, and I have to wonder about this guy who he's working for <laughs> as well. The young man is so hungry, he's thinking about eating the pig slop or whatever grain or whatever food gets set out for the pigs. He's looking at what they're eating and thinking, I might, I might eat that. I might have to eat that. I have read stories of, of prisoners in uh, prison camps during World War II, whether they were in military camps or in civilian concentration camps, who they'd, the, the food was so bad, so given to them so often as rotten, that they'd look to find pieces of grass and pluck up pieces of grass and try to chew on that just to have something to fill their stomachs and maybe the littlest bit of nutrition from it. That's what this guy is going through. He's thinking about eating what the pigs are eating. Verse 16, it says, No one gave him anything. <laughs> so like I said, I have to wonder about this guy who he's working for. He's not treating his uh, servants well if he's not feeding them. So this man is in really tough shape. But sometimes it seems, human nature being what it is, that you have to hit rock bottom before you start looking up. And so this young man is out in the field with the pigs and he's got some time to process, to think, to start to internalize, to reflect. Previously in the wild living, he could sh any prompting of conscience or anything else, he could just shut up. 
and it would be blanked out by the noise and the party and the laughing and the loud music and everything going on. I doubt loud music is a thing with our generation. I expect it's always been a, a thing. All right, verse 17. He came to himself. <laughs> In his thought process, it finally dawns on him, wow, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I'm perishing with hunger. They just don't have enough. There's an abundance. There is extra. Our God is able to bless us above what we might ask or think, beyond what we might imagine. There's an abundance of grace and blessing that God has ready for us if we'll just see him as a God who loves us and wants to help us in our lives find peace and joy and fulfillment and purpose and trust that he will provide. So this young man, is it's dawning on him, wow, back home, they're doing all right. I'm starving. They're having a good meal. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. That is a uh, amazing r dose of reality that's come to him. That he has done wrong against his father, but also against God. In the Psalms, David often phrases his statement as, I have sinned against God. When Joseph was tempted by Mrs. Potiphar, he said, how can I do this great wickedness against God? Let alone his boss. I have sinned against heaven and against you. So he's, he's putting together <laughs> what he's going to say. This is his confession. And he's thinking about how he's going to fess up. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's thinking about his physical need, but he is nervous about how his dad is going to view him. And maybe his dad would say, you blew it, son. You blew it. I don't think I can trust you anymore. And so maybe I could be a hired servant. I'd at least have enough food for my tummy. I appreciate he's willing to, to honestly fess up to what he's done, but his picture, his mental picture of his dad's love is still limited. He doesn't see his, his dad as his dad really is. So 20, he makes the decision. He arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now in this parable, unlike in the previous two, in the, you know, the shepherd was seeking, the woman was seeking. In this one, you might kind of wonder, well, why didn't the dad hire a private investigator and track his son down? Well, not so easy then. Not so easy then. So there's, you know, you don't want to make these parables walk on all fours. Um, where we want to see the father is right now. His dad has been watching for the slightest indication from his son that his son is going to t do a turnaround. And the father has been pouring out love and prayer for that son all this time. 
and watching and watching for that son. And now he sees him. And when he sees his son coming up the driveway, coming along the dusty road, whatever it might have been, the dad doesn't say, well, look who's finally coming home. All right, we'll just see what he has to say for himself when he gets here. No, the dad runs to him. The dad is eager. The dad's heart is just exploding with joy and love. And he runs to his son, grabs him, hugs him, and kisses him. And the son is so startled, he's not quite sure what to do, but he remembers, I had a speech. I had a speech, and I better get it out. Verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he doesn't get a chance to say the rest of it. I'm only worthy to be one of your hired servants. He didn't quite get the whole speech out. His dad interrupts him and calls out to the servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. Not only are we going to give him clean clothes, give him that robe, the robe of righteousness. We'll get rid of those dirty clothing. But he's going to get a nice robe, sandals on his feet. He's going to get a ring on his finger, too. That ring is what they used to seal orders or letters of, of communication or contracts. You know, these days we use, you know, stamp things. But in those days, they used a ring, and the ring would have, uh, a, you know, something carved onto it that would indicate who it was. So he is returning. He is giving back to his son the role he once had. He's giving him family authority again. This is full restitution. This isn't partial. We humans may question whether someone who has done some wrong come back. Are they for real? That's understandable, but God knows the heart. And God says, I give, when you, when you return to me with all your heart, I give you full authority as a child of God. You have every right to call upon the blessings of heaven. You have every right to lay upon the power of God for your life. We're not, we're not coming back 90% or 80% or halfway. It's 100% back. Put it back. Then he calls, says, bring the fatted calf here. Kill it. Let's eat and be merry. We're going to have a party, a celebration. Why? I thought my son was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. And everyone in the household was thrilled, except everyone in the household was thrilled. They began to make merry. Now, the older son was in the field. He came near the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and says, what's going on? What do these things meant? <laughs> the servant is thrilled. Your brother has come home, and he's been received safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. And instead of saying, he's back? Really? Oh, this is so exciting. Instead, he's angry and wouldn't go in. His dad goes out to him and says, son, please come in. No, not going to. And he says, look, I have been serving you all these years. I didn't do anything wrong, and you never even gave me a young goat that I could have a party with my friends. Whoa. What does this say about his feelings about his father? He views his father as exacting, as harsh. If he'd asked for a goat, he would have gotten it. In fact, the dad makes it clear uh, in the next verses. 
I already divided my estate with you. These things are yours. You could have taken the goat. You'd have every right to. But the son's view of his dad and how he is living his own life is harsh and narrow and exacting and unforgiving. As soon as this son of yours came home, you and had the one who devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Unforgiving. Unwilling. An unforgiving spirit is dangerous. There's another parable Jesus tells about the, the servant who had been forgiven much but wouldn't forgive a little debt. He was unforgiving. This is, whoa, serious stuff in God's sight. Verse 31, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It is right that we should make Mary be glad. Your brother who is dead is alive again, who is lost and now is found. In these three stories, we see about the seeker, Jesus, and the Father, God, and how they are invested in redeeming and welcoming home. We who've been astray, who've gone astray, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone each one to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. What a God we serve. What a God. Loving, generous, kind, beyond what we could ask or think. Just amazing. Thank you. Let's sing our closing hymn. In 522, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
bow our heads for closing prayer. Father God, we're just overwhelmed by these stories of your love and care. You came seeking for us. You never give up. You never quit. No, no matter how far someone has gone, they are redeemable because nothing with you is impossible and your love is beyond all measure. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.